Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm with my good friend, Carol Jean. Carol uh, runs the YouTube channel, Mind Your Autistic Brain with Social Audi, uh, and she has some great advice about parenting and, and life in general. So thank you for being here. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Alex. I can only share what knowledge I have acquired from my own perspective. I can't say that I have like the be all end all <laughs> tips right. for parenting, but I could definitely share what I have learned with having now two teenage boys, both neurodistinct thinkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, so the first question is, tell me a little bit about your diagnosis process and how long you've been diagnosed. Okay, well, I'm actually going to use the term identification. I got that from my friend Diane J. Wright of Autastic, and I think it really awesome. speaks and is a little bit more inclusive because so many of us aren't able to get a formal medical diagnosis. It right. isn't always an option. It isn't always something people have access to all over the world. And since we're a global community, so we always talk about identification in my autistic brain. So I'm going to speak to identification. Um, I love my son was originally, my eldest son was originally the first one who was identified as autistic in our family. He was okay. 10 years old and we were going through the process with a neuropsychologist. And this whole process had started when he was at the end of four-year-old preschool. So we've been going through this for almost five years before we got an official answer of any kind with any help whatsoever. Sure. And I yeah, know yeah. so many parents, so many of us who are late identified autistic adults go through the same thing where it just is a long drawn out process. Sometimes it's not a, a quick wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. It's just sort of years and years oh, of yeah. just trying to find somebody to give you an answer. And we had found a neuropsychologist, which are not all that um, readily available. And he was about an hour and a half, two hours away from us. So we traveled to go see him all right. to, to get this, right? And as we met with him and you go through the process as the parent, you answer all of these questions on your child's behalf from your perspective. I was sort of really relating to so many of the questions. Okay. I was thinking, gosh, I did that, or I do that now. <laughs> and so it, it was one of those things where it was sort of percolating down through the soil of my brain, and it mm. hadn't quite registered. And we went back a few weeks later to receive the report and for the doctor to go over everything with us. And he stops at one point and looks at me and says, you know, you were missed. And I looked at him, just kind of like in my very autistic, literal brain. I'm not missed. I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't missed me, <laughs> you know. Um, and he said, you are also autistic. He said, you need to come back and see me. And I thought, yeah, okay. Let me, let me handle and help my child first, because apparently yeah. I've missed so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I did eventually go back and talk to him, but... It, it was one of those things where I didn't do anything with it right away. I okay. shelved it for about two years because I was more focused on what can I do to help my son? How yeah. can I make sure that he has all of the, you know, occupational therapy and speech therapy and vision therapy and anything that I can do to help him in the world so that he has a, a, a less stressful, overwhelming, burnt out life than I had apparently been having, exactly. not knowing. So it was, it was really such a beautiful thing because it started to open a lot of insight to not just myself, but my insight into my children, my insight into my, my family, my immediate and extended mm -hmm. family. And we have succinctly started to learn more about one another and maybe even communicate and have repaired relationships because we just realized all of a sudden through this one instance with my son, it has had this beautiful ripple effect in our whole family. Mm -hmm. Case of the positive butterfly effect. Absolutely. I like it. Very, very cool. Uh, so did you notice anything atypical when looking at other parents about your parenting strategies before your diagnosis? Well, I'm just going to be honest with you, Alex, when I read your question, I thought, hmm, did I? And I thought, nope, I was pretty much in my own little ballpark. <laughs> you know, 
And my dad has always said about my sister and I, he would say to my mom, you know, I don't care that the kids are out in left field. Can't they just be in the same ballpark with the rest of the kids? <laughs> I can't, I honestly, Alex, I can't say that I really noticed right. other parents parenting. I really, I was so overjoyed to be a mom. It was something I had wanted desperately in my life. And at one point, I didn't think I was going to be able to be a mom on my own. So it was a really big thing for me. And in that, all I wanted to do was just spend time with my children to just really connect with them and be as much a part of their daily world as I possibly could. And to me, really, that was just it. And I don't know that I noticed other parents. I mean, sure, I read the parenting books and I went to the, you know, how to how to communicate, be the best parent kind of things in those early days when I was still learning how to, to parent. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. there's no there's no book of any kind out there that says, you know, hey, this is how to be the best parent. What parents can do is say, hey, this is what we learned and we'll share with you. And so that's kind of what I did. And honestly, I think I just one of the things I intentionally chose before we really started getting out of, you know, diapers and into the busier toddler years and things and the, like that, I made a real conscious decision. And I think it was because not knowing I was autistic, I had, and still not at this time, because he was 10 when we finally started to get this information. But even early on, I made the decision to not over schedule our lives and our family. Because even when your children are in diapers, you know, you're, they go to Mother's Day out, you know, two days a week. So from nine to 12, you can go get your nails done or you can go have lunch with the girlfriends and, and not be mired in dirty diapers your entire life for their, that period. But, you know, in that you can still get overscheduled because there's birthday parties, there's all these things. And it's somehow yeah, when, yeah. when you start a family, there tends to be these these societal norms and expectations that you start to participate in all these new things. And I think just intuitively on some instinctual level, I was like, well, no, <laughs> we're just going to put the brakes on, on scheduling too much stuff. Cause I did notice some of my girlfriends, they were running ragged. I mean, they were living yeah. in their cars. They were driving kids everywhere. And all I could think was that's not the quality of life I want for myself. And that's not the level of anxiety that I want in my world or for my children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a three present rule for Christmas. That's it. You know, grandparents got one, Santa Claus got one, mom and dad got one. That's it. Three. Cause really anything more than that is just overwhelm. Oh yeah. And it was sort of the thing that I think probably my kids in retrospect, now that they're teenagers have even said, you know, mom, I really enjoyed my childhood. I enjoyed being able to go play outside and yeah. I really loved not having to constantly be in the car because they hate that too. I mean, there's been seasons where we've been busy because we really, that was what was happening in that season of life. And it's just really, gosh, we would come home and all of us would just crash, you know, and it was just stressful for all of us. So yeah. I think that's probably my best insight on that is just try not to over schedule yourself and your children. That, that really no comparison out there because that comparison is the thief of joy. So do not compare yourself to other parents, other families, because as neurodistinct families, we're going to operate differently. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no need to make a comparison, basically. Like, you just got to do what makes you comfortable. Right? That's right. Cool. All right. Um, so what do you think, like, your neurodiversity made it more challenging to parent uh, than if you weren't neurodiverse? Um, hmm. Well, since I have never had a... a, a a neurotypical brain I can't really answer that question yeah. <laughs> but what I can what I can say is that I think it is probably the greatest blessing that I have that I have that same or similar perspective and experiences in the world so that I can so very deeply relate 
to my children. Okay. Because I have experienced sensory overwhelm on so many different levels, since I do approach problem solving, you know, in a very methodical process oriented way, you know, I don't like a lot of change. I don't like transitioning from one thing to the next without sort of a buffer in between sometimes. I mean, I also have ADHD. My youngest son has ADHD and my eldest son is autistic. So, you know, we, I having both really relate to both of them. And it has been such a blessing Mm because I think so often um, neurodistinctiveness runs in families. It is a commonality, but it's not always the case. And when you don't have that experience or that perspective and from your child and you, there's a big disconnect there for a little bit, there's a big learning curve. And it's not that, you know, I parent better or, or different or less than anybody else. It's just that that is an advantage that I have because I can relate to that. Um, I don't know that it would be easier because if I couldn't understand and relate to my children the way that I do, it might have been harder for them and it may have been harder for me. Mm, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like that a lot. Um, that, that's the same thing for me, like me being a neurodiverse camp counselor. Um, like I see a, a lot of neurotypical counselors get really frustrated with the neurodiverse campers. Uh, and, and like they don't fr- show, but I can see it in their eyes. Um, and yeah. that's because they don't understand, they can't experience that. Well, you know, that's just from a, a human perspective, Alex, mm-hmm. we all communicate in a different way. Every human does. For we sure. have a yeah. communication language where that's how we deliver information. And we also have a different communication language for how we like to receive information. You know, those two are not always the same. And just being aware of that and knowing that there is diversity in communication styles just across humanity from person to person neurotypical or 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 neurodistinct when you know that and you know how to sort of identify what those markers are for each different type of communication you can go oh okay I got you this is I I get where you're going and it's okay and there's a whole lot less frustration and there's a whole lot less internal judging of someone else being less than or that somebody is being difficult or challenging right. when really that's not the case. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely isn't. Um, and I think it's a lot uh, better for uh, neurodistinct people to understand that. Yeah. yeah. So how did your uh, parenting strategy change after your identification? Oh, I don't know that it changed because then I'd have to have had like an official strategy to start with. And I'm not that much of a planner, I guess I am in in some respects, Mm -hmm. but you know, that's a really good question. And I had to really think on that one, Alex, I love your questions. Um, For me, since I didn't really dive into it until about two years after my son's identification, when I decided that it was time for me, <laughs> because I was in burnout. And I think that's where so many late identified autistics come to yeah. the knowledge and awareness that they are autistic, whether it's a formal identification or just self-identification. It is one of the biggest aha moments and relief because I hadn't taken time to really look at it and to dive into what autism is and and specifically what autism is to me and what autism means in my life because it's different to each one of us Mm -hmm. and part of that process is to step back and to take the time to sort of unlearn relearn and just introduce yourself to you right that's important And and it's such a big step and I think in the process of me learning what burnout was, uh, finding ways to help myself recover and find that balance and harmony in my life, I think that I probably became a much better parent and a much better human all around Gotcha. because I've been able to let go of a lot of the 
limiting and false societal norms and beliefs that I thought were true. And I had agreed to them and I was operating under this, you know, assumption that this is how life was supposed to be. And it was just really hard for me. Oh, and yeah. I just hadn't figured it out and I couldn't get it. And everybody else seemed to be doing it so much better and easier than me. And I think that has probably been the greatest shift in my humanity and in my parenting, because I've also been able to let go and allow my children to explore and to be more themselves. You know, I felt like I was always having to protect them before to, you know, tell them, well, this is how you need to act at the birthday party. This is what you need to say. You know, if this child says this, how do you engage and interact? And so, right. And it was just simply this, this parental safety mechanism that I had to want to protect my children from getting hurt because I had been hurt that way. Oh, yeah, and I think yeah. so many of us, you know, late identified parents in particular, we do that. We do that with our babies because we don't want them to be hurt. We want their lives to be easier and have, you know, all the better things and things that we didn't have. Absolutely. And that has been a really big shift. I think not in strategy, just but an overall approach to parenting is just taking a deep breath and going, you know what, guys, you don't have to do it how anybody wants to do it other than how you think is right. That aligns with your values and that was right. really sort of the shift that we made in our household it's you know what are your your internal values what do you value what's important to you mm-hmm. and I think when we instill that in ourselves as parents and then also help our children to to figure out what that is for them then we don't have to say when they're getting in the car at 16 to go out on a date or to go to a party with friends you don't have to say now, make sure you're home at this time. Make sure that you're driving safe. Make sure you don't do this. Don't do drugs. Don't drink. You know, all of those things. Because you know that at that point, you have cultivated this internal value system that your child is already going to go, yeah, that's that doesn't line up with me. So no thanks. Yeah. And you know what? We're all going to try stuff. So just know that they're going to do things and and just be be mindful that when they do, it's not the end of the world. They haven't been bad. They haven't, you know, broken the rules to the point that, you know, it's going to be devastating for the rest of their life. There are things that they can do that will be. And just, that's just part of the scary part of when your teenagers go off in a car by themselves. Yep. But, you know, I think just having that perspective, just to know that you've done everything. And at that point, you do just have to trust that you have done all the things to give your children those those skills, those tools, and those values within themselves, and their their values, not yours. I I like that a lot. Like, be unique to who you are. That's a great strategy. Yeah. Um, what advice do you give to your children about how to handle the extra stresses of neurodiversity? Ooh, now this one. <laughs> this is this is all I can ever do on this is to share my own experience, to share the knowledge that I've gained. And boy, have I gained a lot. (laughs) It's been eight years now since my identification as autistic. And I have done a tremendous amount of self-work. I've done a lot of growth and change. And I am not the same person I was a year ago, two years ago, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, before I knew, oh my gosh, I look back at that, you know, decade old me. And I'm just like, wow, bless your heart. You poor thing. You were trying so hard. Your heart was in the right place, but you just didn't get it. You hadn't gotten there yet, sister, but you're getting there. Um, With that, I I think the biggest thing that I, I found for myself and the thing that I try to let my children know, because they're, they're both still in that process of trying to figure out their place in the world as teenagers. Mm-hmm. I mean, one is just turned 18 and one is about to turn 16. And at that point in your life, you know, you're, you're still Superman and, you know, there's nothing, Invincible. there are no barriers in the world, right? Invincible. I think we yep. all remember that, right, Alex? <laughs> yeah, but I, I certainly do. 
<laughs> you're closer to it than me <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah i just got up that stage believe me like just <laughs> well you know it's i still see the world as being this very open place but that's because i have really flipped my i've had a quantum flip in my life mm. you know learning more about how my brain works, how my body works as a neurodistinct person. Cause it's not just your brain, it's your body. It's everything oh, yeah. is your brain controls everything physiologically. So if you don't also look at your body as part of that component, you can't really identify the stress that you have in your life. Cause it's going to show up in your body when, and this is one of the things that I share with my kids. It's you hold in something long enough your body is going to run out of the energy that it requires to keep holding it in. Mm -hmm. The tension is so great. And how it shows up is your body's going to, you know, you're going to get a sinus infection. You're going to get chronic headaches. Your neck's going to hurt. Your stomach is going to be sick and upset. There's these physiological symptoms, these signs that your body is telling you when you hold things in. And 90% of the time, 90 plus percent of the time, the reason we're holding those things in is because we're scared. We're afraid to Absolutely. share what's mm -hmm. going on. What are we thinking? What are we feeling? And, you know, with alexithymia, I, I even had a hard time identifying what my feelings were. And so that's one of the things I also sort of incorporate with my, with my boys is, look, you're not always going to know exactly how you feel and you're not going to be able to sometimes get to that place mm -hmm. to talk about it. And, you know, Brene Brown studies and researches shame, courage, and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And none of those exist individually. You cannot be courageous without being vulnerable. Right. And being vulnerable mm -hmm. means also being smart about it. You you have to choose to be vulnerable with people who have earned the right to hear your story. Definitely. And that's a short <laughs> list. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, it's usually a really small list, a handful or less for most people. Mm -hmm. You don't really need more than one or two. If you've got one, you're doing great. You've got to have that one safe place, that one safe person, that true connection relationship, that that is your person. And the way that you handle the stress and the anxiety and all of the things that go with being neurodistinct in the world, that comes with learning because it's not something we do automatically if we have gone our whole life not knowing we were autistic. We've really learned to suppress and hold things in for so long. And mm -hmm. if we have not discovered how to verbalize or share our feelings, even if we've known our whole life that we were autistic, there's still a challenge there. It's not like just because you knew at the age of six that all of a sudden, you know, you have a different experience. You're still going to have similar challenges. And right. that is just simply knowing that you have a safe person where you can be vulnerable and you can just say, look, I don't know how I'm feeling, but let me just start talking and trying to get it out. And for me, that's where I get the clarity. And I do the same thing with my boys. I'm like, look, your body is screaming across the room. You have really had a bad day and you're sitting here not talking and that's okay. But I just want you to know, I, I can tell that you've had a really rough day. Oh, and yeah. when you're ready, I'm here and you can come talk it out. And, you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, I, I really need to just get it out. And sometimes they're like, no, nah, I do kind of need a minute, mom. And that's okay too. But also just sort of letting them know it's okay not to be able to put words to something right off that you just kind of start messy is what I say. Just start oh, yeah. messy, just throw it out there. And it's amazing if you look at the beginning of that conversation at where you end up at the end of that conversation, what was really going on and, and how you could see them getting clarity just by starting that conversation. That, that's my insight on it. <laughs> on it. How do you help your kids with, with anxiety and stress of being neurodistinct? That's it. Yeah, that, that's great advice. I think I'm going to do that exact same thing with my campus too. Um, Cause I mean, obviously we're going to be such a big role model to them. They're going to do what we do. Um, so I think like, making those healthy decisions about emotional health and all that. Uh, 
then how that relates to physical health, that's going to be a big part. It is. And, you know, it's really, it's a tough thing. And I think, Alex, when you're mentioning your campers, you know, it's the very similar. You know, you look at any child that's in your care and you want to protect them. You want them to have a really great experience and you want them to really fully embrace and be able to live their their full wholehearted best selves. Yes. And part of that also is just not comparing and letting them know you don't have to compare yourself to how all the other kids are doing things. Mm -hmm. Just That's, like be your own guy or, or and all that. Yeah. And you know, sure, there is definitely some benefits to sort of going with the flow and being part of the crowd and doing what everybody else does. But there's also a time and a place for that, just like there's a time and a place just to be you. And if you need 10 minutes between activities and nobody else seems to get it and they're all like running from archery to swimming, like wide open, like crazy wild Indians, that's okay. Let them go. You don't have to. <laughs> like I say, you don't have to. And I think that's a really big thing that empowers children and empowers humans, you and me, adults, to just oh, yeah. give yourself permission that you don't have to do something like everybody else. It's okay. And if somebody says, you know, hey, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you doing this? You're just like, it's not my thing. It's mm. not my choice, you know. Yeah. Okay, you guys go have fun. <laughs> yeah, um, that kind of thing happened today. Like uh, the whole the whole counselors, all of them were doing tie-dye shirts. And I was just like tossing a football with one of my friends because I, I just didn't want to do it, you know. So like. You know, I, I totally relate to that. Uh, what I did was I was like, look, here's my shirt. Does anybody want to do an extra one? Anybody feel like like doing it? And there's always somebody <laughs> like, oh my gosh, me, I'll make your shirt for you. I'm like, awesome. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I gave my shirt to someone else. That's literally what I did. Yeah. <laughs> See, Alex. Awesome. That's so awesome. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so what advice can you give uh, adults with autism who are looking for or afraid to become parents? Okay. So for neurodistinct people who are looking to become parents, mm. that that's that's a big one. I mean, for me, I didn't know, and I I wouldn't do it any differently. I wouldn't choose not to be a parent. Um, I would definitely have known more things about myself, which would have made a difference. Um, but I think just across the board to just all humans really have that's such a personal decision whether you not whether or not you have children for me it believe me I did all the finances were not perfect you're not that's just never going to happen there's always going to be something that needs to be done when it comes to making a decision to be a parent um, and the other thing is really make sure that you are in a place where You've got the support because babies, you got to have some help. I'm just saying, you know, there are a lot of people out there that, that do it. You know, they're single parents and single moms and, you know, single dads. And gosh, I, I have so much admiration for that because even as a married woman with lots of family that all wanted to show up and help and that in itself is sometimes a little overwhelming, um, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you have some sort of a support structure to not physically or well, sometimes physically, but not financially or anything like that. I mean, sometimes you're going to need help, but make sure that you're in a place where, you know, that's the not, that's not going to be what's like completing you or filling you up because you're missing something. Because honestly, I love my children, but they don't complete me. I have to complete me first. Right. And when I, I learned that missing part of myself as autistic and I started to fill up and really renew and restore and complete my whole self with that, I think I became a much better human and I became a much better parent. And as far as being afraid, man, that's just, ooh, that's just part of it. <laughs> you Sometimes you just got to do it afraid. But just, you know, right. like with anything, just you put your heart and your intention in it and it's it's whatever fits your life and is what is best for you and your family. Children are a blessing, but they're not everybody's blessing, you know? Sure. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
All right. Um, well, that is going to conclude this interview. Uh, thank you very much for coming on, Carol. And uh, hopefully everyone out there uh, is going to learn some good advice from this. So well, I hope so, Alex. Thanks so much for having me. And if anybody is interested in taking the next step in their late identified autistic journey, the unveiling method takes you through that process. It is one I developed over the last eight years for myself, and it is what has brought me to great peace and joy and freedom and to a place in my life where I am living a wholehearted and full life. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, definitely be sure to check her out. She She's helped a lot of people and she will continue to. So yeah. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Alex. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.